Thank you. Um, it is a genuine pleasure to be here today to talk to you. There we go. Talk to you about this really phenomenal new instrument that's coming online. Um, this is an artist rendition, but I do promise I will show you real photos of this. Um, we're going to talk about techno signature opportunities, um, and I'm going to focus on LSST and the Vera Rubin Observatory because it's amazing and you should all be excited about it. But everything I say, I want you to take and insert your favorite other optical and near infrared telescope. I think most of the techniques that we have developed and we need to develop can be applied to every other survey that's running. And so LSST, good. We're all for it. Um, but I want you to apply this to everything else as well. I think this is a, a general call to the community that I come from, the stellar community, the galactic structure community, to embrace technosignature research as a core part of what these surveys can do. So as an astronomer, we have to reflect before we can project and move forward. So I wanted a, a question that Howard asked at dinner last night, which is, was there a catalyzing moment that got you interested in, in, uh, interested in SETI and tech signatures? And, and my answer was yes. Um, I was working at a different telescope in 2007, and I was driving through Roswell, and, which is a charming town, and you should all visit. Um, and they had on the wall in the UFO Museum the Journal of UFO Studies, they had three editions going back maybe 50 years. I wish they were for sale in the gift shop. I would have bought them all. Um, and it was one of those like light bulb moments where I thought, oh, these surveys and this optical data that I'm learning to use for my thesis and learning to use to study stars like our sun, uh, if these intelligent things are out there, if UFOs are out there, if uh, signs of life are out there in the universe, we could use this technology. Um, and, and so for the last 15 years, this has been rattling around in my head. And so it's genuinely a joy to stand here and talk to you all, like-minded people, about this. Because for the last two years, which have been very lonely and very difficult, this has been a topic that I've been blessed to be able to work on with people. Um, and so it is a joy to sort of come out of the pandemic, as it were, uh, and be with you all and talk about this. This is the current, uh, this is maybe two weeks ago, a, a view of the mountain uh, here in Sierra Pachon in sort of northern Chile. This is the Vera Rubin Observatory. This is an auxiliary telescope that will sort of be a companion instrument monitoring the sky in real time, sort of studying bright stars and atmospheric conditions. But here it is. This is the answer. This is the punchline. It is a real thing, uh, and it is coming online very soon. This is the status of the facility about not long after I was driving through Roswell. Here's everybody uh, dressed in typical astronomer fashion. Um, sitting on the newly cast 8.4 meter mirror uh, just over in Arizona. Um, this was a, a, an important moment because, you know, it became real. We had a real thing here. There was not much metal. The camera wasn't built yet, but we had a mirror. Um, and, we, you know, we just needed to polish it and, and coat it. But we had a mirror, and this meant that the facility was real. It started to feel tangible. Um, and here it is. We ask you now not to sit on the mirror. It is polished. It is in the telescope. Um, but here is the facility. It's a, a beautiful facility. It has this very shiny, oops. No, I'm going the wrong way now. It has this very shiny dome for cooling. Lots of uh, airflow considerations going on. Lots of interesting technology. There's a small supercomputer housed here on site, which we'll talk about what its purpose is. In a nutshell, this survey, uh, running on the Vera Rubin Observatory, is a very wide field very deep optical survey over 10 years. It's a time domain survey. Some people like to say it is a movie, an IMAX movie, as Steve said, a movie of the night sky. And so this is the largest, deepest movie, a uh, deep meaning faint, uh, deepest movie of the night sky we've ever taken. It's an amazing facility from hardware. Uh, it's also an amazing facility for software. OK, I keep putting, I'm joining the, the confusion here. Hardware and software in this mission are equally important. I think that's, that's a, an important point here, is that we've done a, as much effort in developing the software to run this instrument and to make discoveries with it as we've done with the hardware. First, a little bit of name disambiguation. So the Vera Rubin Observatory is the place and the overall project. We're very fortunate to have it named after such a, 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 an important astronomer. I think this is a wonderful name. The Simonier Survey Telescope, uh, due to uh, generous donations from Charles and Lisa Simone and the Simone Foundation made the instrument happen, made the actual hardware happen. Uh, it used to all just be called LSST, and so many of you may still know it by that name. Uh, and you write a few million lines of code and you don't want to change it. And so there was a lot of motivation to keep LSST somehow. There was a lot of good branding behind it. Um, but I've, and so it used to be called the, legacy, uh, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, right? 
Uh, and now we have, I think, I will argue, this is a much better name, the Legacy Survey of Space and Time. I think every word in that name is superior to large, synoptic, yeah, obviously it's large. Um, yeah, the Legacy Survey of Space and Time. And all this is sort of brought together under the LSST Corporation, a nonprofit that does enabling science work, uh, which Breakthrough has become a member of, and, and I think we're doing really wonderful projects. Okay. The technology is really fascinating. I, I think this is really wonderful. I worked at a small telescope, sort of a traditional ref reflector. Um, it is one of the largest single cast mirrors in the world. It's 8.4 meters in diameter. Uh, but it has about a six meter effective area. Part of that is it's a very wide field of view, very fast telescope, f1.2. So this is a very fast piece of glass. Um, it's very squat. If you're going to move this thing around the sky very rapidly, you don't want a very long uh, uh, lever to have to whip around, so they made it very squat. And one way you do this is this is not called M1, mirror one, as most telescopes would define it. This is M1 slash M3, right? So the light comes in, bounces off the outer annulus of M1, then off the very large secondary, then off the third mirror, which is a different prescription ground in the same piece of glass, which is really, really neat, uh, and then up into the camera. And the camera f floats up here. What is that effectively prime focus? Um, it's wide field of view, three and a half degree diameter field of view. So it's a huge field of view. Many moons can fit inside of this field of view. The camera itself, the largest digital camera ever created, three, 3.2 gigapixels. Um, it's you know, the size of a small car, which is amazing. Uh, riding with the camera is a filter exchanger. So we'll talk about the filter system in a minute. But there's this amazing filter exchanger. And while this GIF is somewhat low res, um, the technology here of moving the filter into the field of view is way, way fancier than anything we ever had of filter wheels or filter sliders or anything like that, or you know, screwing something into the telescope, which is what we used to do. This is a really amazing uh, piece of technology here, just getting the mechanics here to work uh, and to work at cold temperatures uh, on prime focus. Uh, here is the camera. It is very close to us right now. It's currently at Slack, just up the road. Uh, here it is as of a, f a couple weeks ago. They're testing cooling systems on it. There's some, uh, some new development going on for how they're going to cool this. Um, the camera is here. I think it's here for the rest of the year, and I think it's going down to Chile. Almost everything else is at Chile at this point. The camera is the last big thing that's, uh, that's still in the States. And here is an example from a couple years ago of one of the filters. I think this is the G-band filter. I don't remember. Uh, these filters are the largest optical filters of their kind in the world, right? Just the technology to coat a piece of glass with this uh, filtering material and make sure it's homogeneous and flat and perfect. Uh, please don't drop this, guys. Um, there's six of these filters, and they're, each of them are, are an achievement. Beyond the hardware, the hardware is amazing, but I'm not an engineer. Uh, there is a really rich science collaboration community. Currently, there's eight science collaborations. Um, I put stars by ones that I think might be interesting to people in this room. But over the last day and a half, I think I would basically put stars on all of these now after hearing some of these other talks. Right? We have everything from uh, the edge of the universe, dark energy, AGN, all the way to things moving in the near field. Right? We've got lots of solar system work. This is actually maybe one of the most amazing areas of science right now, solar system science. Um, and I think, critically, informatics and statistics. Again, software and algorithms are a key part of this survey. There we go. And to echo something that uh, Chris said uh, this morning, open source software, open source data. The data comes off the telescope and is made publicly available to most people throughout the world instantly. Um, and the software, though it is a humongous repository and you probably don't want to go read it uh, all line by line, all the algorithms that are underpinning this survey are publicly available and uh, are, are resources for the community. We envision this to be a data set and a code base that helps run future surveys. Um, the theme of the meeting is cheap. This is not cheap, right? I mean, that's a roughly billion dollar instrument, a billion dollar facility. But the value you get, I'm telling you, it's a great value. It's a great deal uh, for what you're getting. Uh, building it costs you know, much less than any space telescope. Uh, and the amount of science we're going to get out of it is incredible. Uh, here is a timeline. I took it from the web. So you know, this is the official guidance for this. You can't read anything on this timeline. There's lots of pretty pictures. So let me just zoom into the relevant piece here. Um, so you, know, you are here uh, somewhere in mid-22. 
Uh, first light, we've had about a year, year and a half of COVID delay like everyone else in the world. First light is scheduled um, for sometime early next year. That does seem to be on track. Uh, we have a, a different camera. So there's an engineering camera that we bolted on before the main camera gets bolted up. Uh, so we will actually get photons through the glass later this year with a test camera. Then we will see first light through the full camera and the full system sometime early next year. There is a six-ish month uh, burn-in window where we're going to test everything. We're going to take some preliminary data. Uh, and then full survey operations begin, fingers crossed, late next year. So for the students in the room, I think this is an obvious timeline to be extremely interested in. It's a 10-year survey that starts essentially next year. And the data comes out effectively in real time. This is a huge resource if you're thinking about studying anything in astronomy in the next 10 years. OK, let's, let's talk some numbers, some fast stats here. Again, this is a deep optical time domain survey. There's six bands spanning essentially the entire optical and near infrared. It peaks into the near infrared here at one micron. This new Y band, while the throughput is not incredible, the science will be, I think, really amazing with this. Um, it's something like 30 second exposures uh, throughout the night, two 15 second exposures usually is how we do it to get rid of cosmic rays. And over 10 years, we have to cover the entire southern sky. So we cover the whole sky every three nights. That means you can do the math. Uh, you get something like 800 to 1,000 visits per star in 10 years with about 30 seconds of total integration time per visit. Um, it goes down to 24th magnitude, uh, five sigma detection to 24th magnitude every visit. Um, and then it goes down when you stack these data to 27, maybe 28th magnitude over 10 years. This means we have a catalog of something like 10 to 20 uh, billion stars and 10 to 20 terabytes of imaging coming off the telescope per night. When these first numbers came out and they said, oh, it's going to be terabytes a night, when these were first announced 15 years ago, people freaked out because nobody had the ability to process terabytes of data, at least no astronomers did. Uh, and you know, like Netflix laughed at us because that was not a big problem. Um, now, terabytes of data per night, the prediction was true. Now, this is doable. It's a lot of data. You don't want to put it on your laptop. But you know, our friends uh, up the road can put it on any number of cloud computing systems and handle this sort of effortlessly. This is not prohibitively large anymore, which is incredible. Um, and then again, I say we have point sources. We have stars, we have galaxies, moving objects. Anything you like, essentially, we've got inside the survey. So beyond a deep optical time domain survey, which I think what many of us have dealt with. We also have this incredible real-time alert system. And this is part of the uh, supernova and kilonova uh, search strategy, being able to detect rare and important events rapidly and get follow-up almost immediately. The stat here, the one number to take away from this is every image that comes off the telescope has to be processed, cross-matched against the reference catalog, and anything that changes has to be published online within 60 seconds. So there's a real-time data stream within 60 seconds of, of data just literally flowing off this telescope. Uh, and there's all kinds of technology being developed now with missions like the ZTF survey in California uh, for how to deal with millions of these events every night. OK, so whiz bang, LSST is huge, it's amazing, it's going to revolutionize everything. But I'm here to talk to you in the last five minutes about SETI, about technosignature possibilities with this instrument. It's obviously going to be amazing for everything else, all the stars and galaxies and the asteroids we find. The pros. We have this incredibly huge survey telescope, right? Many data types, both images, multicolor images, real-time data. We've got big computational abilities. I said there's a small supercomputer on site. Uh, cloud computing facilities are making things transformative. We've got lots uh, of data. The, the con, if you will, is that these are not data types that normally we think about when we're developing technosignatures, right? We've heard a lot about radio or millimeter wave or laser lines, things that are not necessarily congruent with big wide field optical pictures of the sky. This is not necessarily the data you would go to. This is the data we have, and we have an awful lot of it. This is like learning to cook, but only shopping at Costco, right? Like you have a ton of data. You have to be very clever about how you do things. So we need to develop signals and, uh, and literature about how to do this. So I'm going to mention a few ideas that I have that we've been kicking around with the breakthrough folks. Um, but my, my call to action is if you have ideas, if you have bits of, uh, of data that you want to contribute to this that's complementary, if you have technologies or outlier search strategies you think would be well suited, I want to talk to you about this. I think this is an opportunity for the community. Okay. 
The first is to go back to things that Jason likes. We can look for things like Dyson spheres. Um, these might show up as outliers in color space, although as Jason points out, this Y band is not red enough to actually detect what we think Dyson spheres should do. But the idea of looking for things with weird excesses in color space, multicolor space. So, so we have six bands. We're going to be looking in the astronomer's favorite diagram of the color magnitude diagram, something like this. And we're going to be chopping it up and looking for weird stuff in six dimensional color space. Looking for color outliers, I think, is going to be a really productive way forward. We're going to look for unusual variability of sources. The Kepler mission. Uh, through citizen science, through everyday people looking at the data with their eyeballs, discover this incredible object called Boyajian star, um, these weird flux dips that have continued from ground-based data and long-term variations. This is, this is a perfect example of a seemingly boring star with incredibly unusual variability information, time domain information. This is what LSST is built for. Um, and already, other precursor surveys, like ZTF, like ASAS, and like other surveys, small aperture surveys, are turning up weird stars, right? When you look for weird things, you are going to find amazing stuff. Every one of these objects is bizarre and fascinating and deserving of lots of resources. This is not high-risk science, right? The technosignature side might be high-risk, but the science yield is incredibly low-risk. We're going to find weird stuff, and it's going to be worth follow-up. There are PhDs here to be written. Um, one of my favorite simplest measurements is looking for disappearing stars. So um, this is something that Beatrice Villarreal has been a big proponent of. Uh, her VASCO project is well known now within this community, I think. The, the punchline here is you go back to archives, you have a star, you go to more modern data, the star is missing. What happened to the star? Who knows? Um, we need to follow it up with bigger surveys. Uh, Ruben, LSST, is uh, optimal op instrument for this kind of work because both you can, over 10 years, search for new objects that disappear, that maybe a techno, uh, a, a megastructure is built around it, enveloping the star or something. Um, you also can go back to every one of these candidates with now an 8.4 meter mirror and follow them up and see, oh, no, no, it's just there. It just got fainter. Something else happened. Something boring. Let's write a nature paper about it. And maybe the most interesting for this community, and something that I think is worth pushing for in the next year, particularly, is looking for things that are moving within our solar system. So this is the yield of asteroids from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, this very well-known visualization from Alex Parker, uh, his painted stone video here. You can see this small telescope discovered an enormous population of asteroids. And we expect, with Rubin, something like a 25-fold increase in the total asteroid population within the first year or two of the survey. Uh, oh, good. We can go for it. That's fine. And so there is an obvious uh, technosignature opportunity here without opining about events that have happened and, 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 and what may or may not be um, interesting from the last two interstellar objects. This is a perfect instrument if you want to look for things coming from outside of our solar system and whizzing by. And if they make a right turn, if they were to make a very unusual motion, we should detect that. And this is a huge opportunity with LSST. The last thing I'll say is that you've got 20 billion stars with about, in total, 500 minutes of monitoring. And while this is not as much as maybe the Kepler or TESS mission provides for any given star, this is an enormous data set. And so when you think about the, the multidimensional haystack that we're searching, uh, that Jason and others have published and, and discussed, we're something like an order of magnitude or more larger, depending on how you define this haystack. Um, this may actually be a really productive way forward in terms of putting upper limits on signals. I don't think this is the only way forward. I think this is just a really productive way forward. And so we should be utilizing these resources. And that's what I'll say. We're coming soon. <laughs>